Today, we're gonna to talk about the best 60 minute workouts. In other words, how you can get the most bang for your buck. We're also gonna talk about raising max heart rate if that happens for any of us. I'm curious to see. We're gonna have a good conversation around that and lots of other things. It's the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Uh, let's get into things first by following up. Nate, you always joke around about sending DMs to me about things. You know, like, uh, like if you have questions about anything, send DMs to Jonathan. They exploded last week from the hot takes <laughs> episode because Chad, you and I and Ivy talking about uh, whether hot air stuff, or stuff cold we didn't air understand. is more dense. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, was it hot air? Uh, Who's we? Sounds like <laughs> <laughs> Ivy's like. No, I'm I had pretty sure. I'm, I'm still. <laughs> oh no! Holding my ground. You're what was quite the question, wrong, Chad? You're I, quite I didn't wrong. listen. Wait. Let me answer. I'll get it right. What was the question? Okay. Okay, so is <laughs> <laughs> Chad just lit them all up again? <laughs> People <laughs> angry type. <laughs> uh, what air? What is more dense? Cold air, cold air, or cold warm air. air? Cold air. Mm -hmm. Warm air has the propensity to carry more moisture, as Chad mentioned. However, that does not make it more dense. Cold air heat, is more dense. Heat we expands. Had, let me explain the, the universe. The the <laughs> broad spectrum of people we had. No joke, we had physicists, like professors. <clears throat> That's we why we had put it out there. Rocket scientists. Know. All yeah, the and way to And all you guys needed was me. James, <laughs> you're amazing. Just a guy named James reached out and he said, I'm qualified to answer this question. I'm a high school janitor. And then he started sharing it. So we had everybody from a rocket scientist to a janitor awesome. angry at Chad and I because we were like, you know. Um, Who said, Sean, jo what'd you say? I said that cold air is more dense. All right, so you were right. You know, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Angry, I said it carries more moisture, and I associated uh -huh. that with density. That's where I got. <clears throat> but here's the deal: I think it's great if we debate these sort of things because, boy, did it increase engagement. That's what so, hot takes are. Know. That's why I came into it <laughs> unloaded. <laughs> I didn't have notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty great. So, uh, Nate, if we would have had you on there, you probably would have just squashed the whole thing. There wouldn't have been any no. debate. <clears throat> like, you know, there's this we, TikTok person. She does cooking, and she does other th stuff like that, but. She will like say she's using a lemon and she will cut an orange and just say it's a lemon and not say anything the whole time. The comments are flooded with what is that? That's a weird lemon. A million views, million likes. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, gotta man. have that one error in there on purpose. So thank you, Chad. I know yeah. you, you got it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So and any errors this time where I'm wrong is because I'm doing it on purpose so that <laughs> there we go. Everyone. Yeah. 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 See if you can find the Easter the eggs. We'll plant them all throughout. So uh, Patrick's question. He says, and this is a great question. You can submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And I would love it if you do that. Y'all do that every week and it's amazing. It keeps the podcast going. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube right now, give this a thumbs up early on. That's great. That'll make more people find it. Uh, Patrick's great question is new muscle gained from strength training quote untrained aerobically. I experienced about a 10 kilogram and he mentions, um, or 10 kilograms of newbie gains mentions that is about 18% of total body weight, 55 kilograms to 65 kilograms. That's a big increase that they had of newbie gains over my first consistent year of lifting, mostly lower body. Some of that might be creatine water weight if they're taking creatine likely, right? Nate, um, packs on Not quite most, a lot of some weight. Of it, yeah. Mm hmm. Is this new quote, virgin tissue untrained for muscular endurance? My power increased about 15% across most zones last year. So I'm thinking the answer to this question is no, I guess I'll see when I put it to the test in endurance mountain bike racing. Uh, there's also an additional question to this and then Chad will step through however you wish. But, uh, Patrick goes on to mention, I also think I should back off the weights and focus on only explosive plyometric speed work, even cutting out eccentric loading to avoid further hypertrophy is I don't want to negatively impact my power to weight ratio too much. That said, I feel so much more solid on the mountain bike now and feel like I can roll over stuff, carrying more momentum, laying down more absolute power on the flats, uh, from so Patrick. Went for about 125 to 145 for that's the a Imperial big, system. That's, yeah. that's a pretty big, uh, especially when you're right. talking about from strength gains, so, we're assuming in this case that it is lean mass gained. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah. I want to say too, yeah. Chad, that when <clears throat> I first started training, I would be like, I, I didn't know anything. And I was like, I'm going to do these squats and then I'm going to turn them into cycling muscles later on on the bike. Mm -hmm. And that was a very common thing that I thought in my head. And it's yeah. a common question we get still. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a complex, it's a big topic. It really is. And geez, just this question, there's so much conversation fodder here. So we, I could just address a couple questions and just bang this out, I think, but man, we can talk a lot on this and I think we should too. So let's, let's pass this back and forth as much as, as much as you guys want to jump in. 
Um, what I have prepared is first a succinct answer, which really is a question. The question that we could reduce this to is you ask yourself, we ask you, how is that mass achieved? Because if you look at the, the nature of the new mass, and, and we call it new mass and you call it virgin tissue, but really it's just bigger mass. It's the same mass that was already there. It's just bigger now. Um, muscular hypertrophy, that's, that's the term. But once you look at how it was acquired, that's going to shed some light on, uh, you know, what, what you're working with now. So consider how it came about in the first place. You know, was it heavy strength work? Was it high volume, still strength work, explosive movements that you mentioned that you're going to shift toward? Because each of them bring with them a really specific set of adaptations and there's plenty of overlap between them. But when we're talking about strength training versus endurance training, we're talking about something that's largely neural, slightly glycolytic, all the way to something on the other side of things that's largely oxidative, bit glycolytic. So these are very much apples and oranges. Uh, we had a question. This is <laughs> this just came to mind because I, I know I took some flack for this one too. But we had a question about push-ups building strength. And someone who who <laughs> if I do a hundred push-ups, am I going to get stronger? And and I maintain my staunch position on this. Heck no, you will not. You you will get really good at push-ups. You will cultivate metabolic conditioning relative to doing a whole lot of push-ups. But push-ups in quantity are endurance work. It, it, they just are. Your body's only so heavy and doing more of them is just going to inflict a higher demand on your energy turnover system and not your ability to generate force. When you're talking about getting stronger, Chad, you're talking about increasing muscle mass, hypertrophy, that sort of stuff that we're talking no, about. No, right? not even that. I'm talking about the ability to exert more force because you can have greater hypertrophy. We get it all the time as endurance athletes in our type one fibers. You can build big, plump, type one fibers. I mean, look at, look at cyclists. There are plenty of really good cyclists out there, really big leg muscles who never touch weights, but they have big muscles because slow twitch fibers, hypertrophy as well. It doesn't necessarily convey high, high force capabilities though, because those slow twitch fibers are low force in nature, you know, the highly oxidative, high endurance, but not a lot of, not a high ability to generate force. Let's say I look like, uh, uh, some of like the, I have the typical body type of like the, the stereotypical body type of a cyclist, like a climber at mm -hmm. zero upper body mass or anything else like that. You're not saying that it would be bad to do a hundred pushups. That would be beneficial for them, right? No. And that's what I wanted to clarify. I mean, we're talking about uh, strictly strength versus endurance, ability to generate force versus ability, uh, the ability to turn over energy. If we're just talking about a stronger in general athlete, then those pushups can go a long way to making you a stronger athlete in general, to making you stronger on the bike, you know, more control, better upper body um, capabilities when it comes to just holding position or riding rocky trails on a mountain bike, et cetera. So a lot of benefit in being able to do those 100 pushups, especially being able to do a bang out 100 of them straight, but not a lot of strength coming with it. Okay. I sure. want to say some, if you are, you can do one or two pushups and you build your way to 100, you're going to have some force increase too, and you're going to be stronger. But when you, you are at 100 and you go to 105, it's not going to be as much as if you're in eight rep max and you go to 10, rep, you know, 10 reps to failure. Yeah, I honestly think any that, force that's going to be better. Any improvement you're going to get in force generation is probably going to come in the early first stages 40? of that. Going yeah. from yeah, exactly, first 40, first 20, first 10, whatever yeah. it may be, it's going to come. It's going to come early on because after that, then it's just repeating it, repeating the same load, the same movement, doing it better because you're more neurally adapted to that movement. There are things that fall into place that don't up the the, the force demand. You can, Any however, cool. up that force demand. You can you can weight it. You can wear a weight vest. You can put a plate on your back. You can put a body on your back. You can do elastic bands across the back. It, whenever they do, whenever I see studies that compare push-ups to, to bench press and, and look at similar strength uh, ad adaptations across them, it's always because they're resisting the push-up somehow. Because again, the push-up tops out. It's just your body weight. Putting it's your only going to get more metabolic demand. Yeah, you can change it's it. Huge. You have to change it in certain ways, but you have to change it. You can't just One go arm. from 10 to 100 and suddenly... So, so I, li I look, like to look at it a couple of ways. First is you can take an athlete who tops out at 10. You can barely get 10 push-ups with good form. Everything goes to hell in a handbasket past that point. And then grow that same athlete to a 100 push-up version of the athlete. Can this new 100 push-up version of the athlete bench press more weight? Can they exert more force? Marginally, maybe, but we wouldn't really call that a strength improvement. So. N equals one on this during my mission. I didn't have any uh, sort of equipment and I had to work out every morning. And I did push-ups. I think that my, uh, I think my PR back then, like my one rep max was 200 pounds or something, uh, back in high school when I raced motocross for bench. Dude, uh, how heavy were you? Uh, I was heavier. Yeah. I was big. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I just imagine I did, this I size bench in 200. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, strong, you know, strong yeah. guy over here. Strong. But anyways, and then, uh, for when I started doing, I started doing just basic like push ups and sit ups and I started out and I was like, after 25, I was like, Oh geez, this is really hard. I got to the point where I could do a hundred ups, Like you're saying, Chad, mm-hmm. I remember at bench pressing after my mission and I could not bench press a lot at all. Like I could do a hundred pushups all day, but I think at my max, I did like 130 pounds and I was just like shaking, like, uh, trying to get that going. Uh, yeah. So and I mean, you could take a bit, one, but you could take the same argument and, and put it in the gym have someone who, who, who's doing ostensible, you know, in all appearances, strength training, strength in quotes here and, and, you know, getting under a, a barbell on a bench, doing bench press, but just pressing the bar. They can push that bar up a hundred times, but does that increase their ability to slap a couple sets of plates on it and do a 225 pound bench press? It doesn't matter if they get up to a thousand of those things. They're, they're growing increasingly metabolic in nature. The, the force demands is never changing. The fatigue's growing, certain other things are happening, but they're not gonna get some big new uh, ability to push big weight. So my, my point is, is that progressive overload isn't everything. Yes, this is progressive in nature, but it has to be of substance and it has to be somewhat specific. You can't just increase the duration of low load work if you want to improve high force capabilities. So it's not in this case of pushups, it's not more pushups. It would be harder or heavier pushups. Chad, this is a little bit like saying, if I spin for an hour, I'm going to improve my sprint. Yeah. Because it's, right, it's very like, much along those lines. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, great analogy. Totally. Yep, and if, and if we get back to the question at hand, I do want to offer a, a, a usable answer here. The the real goal, I think, for uh, who's talking to Patrick? Patrick is you. You want to increase mitochondrial content. I mean, that that's what as an endurance athlete you're hoping to gain from this. You want to add mass, and you want that mass to be metabolically active and and you know, useful in uh, whatever endurance sport you're going to aim it toward. And Interesting, interestingly, along these lines, there is some, I guess you could call it emergent evidence. It happened over the last couple, three years, where the, the term is dilution of mitochondrial volume. And the idea being that as you add mass, the mitochondria, have, there's a lag. The, the muscle hypertrophy actually outpaces the ability for the mitochondria to, you know, biogenerate. So hmm. uh, to, to restate that. Muscle fiber hypertrophy outpaces mitochondrial biogenesis. So your muscles grow quicker than, than you can build mito. So does that confirm the hunch perhaps that Mac, that Patrick has, has proposed here that you may get bigger muscles, but it takes time, more time to convert those over to be efficient towards cycling? If, if that's what you do, if you then steer your training toward taking that muscle, I think, and that's kind of the upshot, kind of what I took from the study that I just mentioned is that you can add mass and then you can condition it aerobically. And this could be, and, and I'm hypothesizing here, but this could be a, a plateau ascending method for increasing your power output. If you've stalled, you simply, no matter what you do, no matter how much you train, or if your training is time constrained, you've pushed up against that ceiling, you can't train anymore, you got to change something, but you don't know what. Well, maybe add a little bit of muscle mass, and then you spend the time trying to condition that muscle mass aerobically. I was right. Back when I started. <laughs> if, if I'm right. This is, yeah. this is why we do like periodized strength training, right? And that's really popular in the off season. Someone might do heavier weights. I think Keegan does this, right? And then he still uh-huh. ma- he does weight training in the season, but it's more of a maintenance than a, like really trying to increase his uh, strength and power. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah, and I think a lot of endurance athletes fall into the maintenance mode. It's what it is. You, you hit that time of year or you hit that time in the training plan where you can strength train, you have the extra energy to do it, and you just kind of do what you've always done. You're not really looking to upset the apple cart. You don't want to change things drastically. You just want to hold on to what you got and then you know shift your focus back to where it well, really ought to be, which is on the endurance side of things. Ivy, have you noticed this? I mean, because once I reference this all the time, but if people don't know, Ivy doesn't just race cyclocross, but she has a background racing road, racing track, racing a lot of different things. How have you incorporated strength training? And I'm curious if you've seen that sort of plateau approach kind of where like you kind of top out, add some more strength training or just add strength training in general, then boom, you kind of ramp back up again with your, your abilities on the bike. Sure. Um, and while you were, while y'all were describing like the ways in which strength training can translate to bike strength, I was thinking about is like the ways in which um, all these other things that we do off the bike, like thinking about sleep, you know, um, like Nate said, endurance riding doesn't make you a better sprinter. Well, getting a lot of sleep doesn't directly translate into, mm. uh, on the bike strength, but it contributes. And I think that's my approach to strength training. And what athletes seem to keep in mind is that there are uses to strength training throughout the season that contribute to things like 
muscle recruitment, core stability that in turn make you a better cyclist that don't actually translate one-to-one into on-the-bike strength, if that makes sense. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. Patrick kind of references that. I love, I can I can actually like feel this because I've felt it before, what Patrick is saying. I can roll over stuff, carry more momentum, laying down more absolute power on the flats and feel more solid on the mountain bike. And that's, uh, for me, when I'm strength training, I feel that not just on the mountain bike, but I feel that on the road bike as well. I just feel more stable, more planted, uh, mm-hmm. it makes it like I, I, it's like I have a more stable base from which I can produce that power on the bike. Um, I'm not just flapping around in the wind all over the place and yeah, hugely beneficial. Out. Even if you don't ride off road, even just being on the road, um, uh, Keith and I were talking about this yesterday, like hour four of a ride, um, when you, when like your back starts to hurt, like if you stay on top of that maintenance, once you start getting in your base season and. Like you were talking about, John, doing like a bigger build and a plateau in your off season and then just, yeah, maintaining. That's when you really start to see the benefits of strength training when like on longer hours of your rides, you don't, your body doesn't start to fail in other places other than your legs, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Nate, you recognize that even, and you did like unconventional strength training. You were like, my neck. It gives out like, hmm. uh, I remember in you talk, I wasn't like also like fatigue or pain between like your shoulder blades or something like the whole upper area on road riding. Right. And what did you do to address that? Well, I didn't do it very well, but <laughs> I got like this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, neck thingy, that you like raise your head up, but really like shrugs. And I never, when I do shrugs with activating my traps, I didn't do them correctly until recently. And I, I changed it where I get a, uh, like a rope. And I, I, hood it, I hook it onto a low cable pull and I kind of walk out a few feet so that it's pulling my arms back from me and then I shrug. And it gets me in a better position than when it's kind of my shoulders are forward. But if I have physical like pulling me back and doing it, I can feel it more. And then like a, uh, like a I don't know, a pretty close grip uh, row from um, like a lap pull down, like from Shake above. Shake weight. Just kidding. What? Sorry. Shake weight. Shake weight. Yeah, shake weight. <laughs> but anyways, one of those, and then really concentrating on my, uh, on my upper traps or, and you know, yeah, pretty yeah. much. And that, that has helped. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about trunk strength and the ability to maintain a proper position on the bike. And there's so many things that can contribute to that, but boy, isn't it like a good feeling when you're riding on the bike and you do have this mention of carrying more momentum, Part of that too is if your power is increased 15% across most zones, that's a huge power increase too. Like 15% FTP, sign me up. Um, uh, I'll sacrifice great things uh, for that, right? Um, That would be great. And when you do that, every little surge or like, I'm thinking on mountain biking in particular, cyclocross, you know, and the same thing with road and gravel, it's just more common on off road. You know, those little bumps or those little sandy sections or that little rock you have to go over. And every time it's like, it requires X amount of Watts to get over it. It's like, no matter what you have to put out 300 Watts. And when your power has gone up 15% across all zones, that means that that 300 Watt hit takes just a little less out of you. And it makes it so that it's easier for you. Like you don't have to take a breath after that, but you can keep and stay on the gas. It all ends up equaling like greater speed. And this is why there's a big fear here. You mentioned it, Patrick, that worried about power to weight ratio. What's your performance like? Is your performance better and in in the relevant racing that you care about or riding that you care about? And if it is, honestly, don't worry about that power to weight. If you feel healthier and you're performing better on the bike, that's what matters. Um, And you can probably get away with things and maybe, you know, who knows, Patrick, maybe you just end up getting a huge amount of hypertrophy and weighing a ton. Then you just pick events that favor you and don't pick events that don't favor you. <laughs> um, well, he's but, 145, 65 kilograms. Yeah. So still pretty light. Like mm-hmm. don't Got be worried about way. it. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I too, we've said this before, but at the same power to weight ratio in almost all situations, it's better to be heavy and have higher Watts than to be light with less Watts. The only time it's different is if you're in a really, really steep climb and I'm talking about really steep, probably steeper than most people have around them. Yeah. Like if you're doing 12% sort of average climbs that, you know, yeah. and they kick up map. even from there. <laughs> I did it once and there was a inflection point, but I don't remember what it is, but something like that. Yeah. It's so, and, and how often is it right? Uh, Chad, when in a race we fixate on that 12%, that little moment where it's like that steep <laughs> thing and we prepare mm-hmm. our entire selves for that one moment. But prior to that in the race, all the moments before then 
we didn't build ourselves ideally and we aren't doing the right things so that when we get to that point, we can be a bit more fresh. It makes mm -hmm. more sense to prepare yourself for the 95% of scenarios rather than the 5% of scenarios, you know? So, so yeah, good on you, Patrick. Yeah, hey, uh, super Patrick could have like a 30 watt increase and yeah, you're right. All the other places, even just the endurance riding towards them. Imagine if everything was just 30 watts less, like oh. at that 12%, you're probably going to put out more power than if you, even if you were the same power to weight ratio lighter, you'd put up a, you'd go faster still. Mm -hmm. We, I, it's those pros, man. You see those pictures of like Tyler Hamilton and stuff, which is like nothing on them and like veins and they're all doped up and stuff. And you go, Hey, that should be me. Right. Um, then look at get sold stuff. That's like a hundred grams less for $500. And you're like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> that should be me too. Everyone else doesn't break down the cost per gram in a spreadsheet sometime. It'll help keep it, keep you honest on it. Um, when you're talking about bike upgrades, <laughs> I did that last time. Remember it was like $5,000 and it was like a quarter pound or something or a half a pound. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah I just, I even, I can't do that. That's bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, look at a great example. I think of an athlete that we can look toward is Remco of Enipol. I know he's quite small. He's not a tall person. He's a short person, but, um, Remco is, is not, uh, a wafy build. Uh, Remco's a, a strong, uh, looks like a strong person, you know, um, and a person that's doesn't seem, I know it, that with the soccer background and everything else, uh, you know, had a, a different background in sport and didn't grow up in cycling and everything else uh, quite to that degree. But I still think, uh, I just worry a lot, you know, we work with our juniors and I, and I know that kids in particular, I'm worried about this, but also adults, right. Too Ivy, like it's not just kids, but we kind of build up these ideals of what we should look like. And so much of that is just based on weight and deprivation to get to that weight as a cyclist. But really we should just be pushing for and performance and capability. Let's go into David's question. He says, I'm stuck between mid volume and low volume plans. I have the capacity to train five days a week, but due to uh, other life circumstances, I can only train for 60 minutes each day. This is a really common scenario, right? Nate, like, uh, just trying to, you know, doing something rather than nothing in 60 minutes is if that's what we, we have, that's what we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, recently my mid volume plan went from only one 90 minute training session per week to two 90 minute training sessions and one 75 minute training session per week. That could very well be because David's levels are getting higher, <laughs> pushing, pushing up the ceiling there. So if I use workout alternates to change my sessions to only 60 minutes, will this impede my training? I haven't switched to the low volume plan as I enjoy five days of training per week for the benefits it brings to my headspace to train regularly. Huge fan of the podcast. Thanks uh, from David. Nate, do you want to start us off on this one? Just on the, the concept of like 60 minute workouts and if they're going to see some sort of detriment to their training, if they swap those slightly longer workouts and use workout alternates to pick the 60 minute version. Yeah. So again, workout alternates too, is when you have your workout, you can click on workout alternates and we'll give you a workout of similar difficulty for different durations, or you can make it a little bit harder, a little bit easier too. And you can do both if you want. And of course, this is a valid way to train. And there is diminishing returns as you put more volume in. It's not linear, right? So, uh, 60 to 90 isn't like 50% better or 60 to 120 isn't twice as fast. And then four hours isn't twice as good as two hours. And it, it just gets less and less. And then you always have to deal against or work against deal with recovery and amount of time that you have and motivation and stuff like that inside of those longer workouts. Yeah, John. Nate, have you noticed that? So we're talking about the, uh, diminishing returns in terms of training benefit and maybe for Nate and for everybody else here, but haven't you noticed that it doesn't seem like the same curve is following for fatigue. Like if I go out and do a four hour ride, that fatigue still continues to ramp up more and more. It seems it's like, like linear, <laughs> but I don't, yeah, it's like linear, but then, you know, I, I get diminishing returns in terms of the training benefit speaking from somebody who has big training, uh, coming up here at the end of my tri plan. So, and so world tour riders, right. They do so much more training than most of us, but even at that level, there are world tour train world tour riders who train too much, who do too long of workouts. And you hear about them dialing it back and actually getting faster and teams trying to manage that better. So th there's always a, a limit. Can you get faster in just 60? Heck yes. Right. We've seen it so many times. There'll be a time where, you know, you will be constrained by how much volume and stuff you do, but that could be, you know, close, maybe closer than you want to go. But you know, it, I'm going to say for a regular person who's a regular man who's like maybe 30 that could be well into the force right 
or even low fives if you have really high natural VO2 max. So you can get really, really fast if you're consistent that whole time. And one thing to think about though, our workout levels with 60 minutes, um, especially with the, with the, as we do more updates and stuff, and I'm sorry, we're still working on stuff. I swear we haven't stopped is that there are certain rides that you just won't get the training benefit in 60 minutes. If you say I'm every one of my endurance rides is going to be 60 minutes. You're going to top out at whatever your FTP is where you can't just build a huge aerobic base in a zone two 60 minute ride. And if you're always doing those things, you have to do things to compensate and be like, well, I'm going to do maybe some sweet spot in there because I get some of the similar benefits, but I get, but I don't have as much time. Um, same with threshold. Like you might do 20 minute repeats three times. That's going to be over an hour. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna do an hour at, at FTP. And that's extremely hard too. And <laughs> if you can probably do that, most likely you're going to want to update your FTP because to do that properly with the right motivation with your actual FTP is extremely, extremely hard. So just know that you'll be pushing against those and you'll have to probably, as you reach those ceilings, bump your FTP up. And it's Chad, I'm not speaking very well this morning. Can you help me out too with the, you know, you get those long rides, you get, you get some adaptations that you just, you can get some from sweet spot and tempo, but you're not going to get exactly the same and they can't truly ever be replaced. Yeah, the, yeah, you're saying it pretty well. I, d just understand that you can pack a lot of quality into a 60 minute workout, and and when you top out within that 60 minute time frame, and you readjust your FTP, and you go at it again, you can probably go through another series of improvements that brings you to a point where you top out. But you're going to be a faster athlete at the end of that. So, and that'll last for as long as it lasts. There will come a point where, just like Nate stated, you, that 60 minute time frame isn't going to allow a sufficient stimulus to bring further, further changes, further improvements. You're not going to get faster past a point, but that point could be a long ways out. It depends where you're starting from, what your natural propensities are, what type of training you're doing within those hours. You're doing it five times a week, which weighs really heavily in your favor if you're spreading that out nicely. So I wouldn't think twice about the fact that you can only work out five hours a week, which is what you're describing. Because if you stack that up against the 60, 60 and the 90, that's only three and a half hours a week. You've got an extra hour and a half on top of what, you know, what you may have been doing on a low volume plan before. But back to the initial point, you can do a lot in 60 minutes and you can see a lot of improvement due to those 60 minute workouts for quite a long time. There's also things to know about, sorry, John, but motivation, where if you do it is so much easier motivated for a 60 minute workout than a 90 minute workout. They can go through faster. Also with fatigue, when you go into like a, sometimes the 90 or two hours, I feel like there's this, y'all feel this too, where you, you almost hit like a fatigue cliff where like, you're good, you're good. Then you go a little bit too far and you're like, oh, I need like three days. That's so hard. <laughs> I meant you're less likely to do that if you're doing 60, especially 60 consistently. So if, if you're recovering from all these hard workouts, rather than doing too much and not recovering, that's also going to be a benefit. Sorry, John. No, oh, yeah. And I, I was going to ask Ivy because Ivy, you've lived the life as like a pro on the road with that being your singular focus these days. You know, we have you here working at trainer road and you have a high workload and everything else you still do just from speaking to you, you still find value from doing hour long workouts, even though you've had this like past as a, as a pro athlete that, and currently a pro athlete, you still find value from sixties. Right. And what David is saying about having so much off the bike in life circumstances that it's preventing them from training more, um, makes me think so much about like, sure. I can maybe be like, I'll find a way to do an extra 30 minutes or an extra hour, or just like get the most out of this training time. But then the ripple effects of how that impacts the rest of my day and my ability to work and fuel and take more time to prepare food. Um, just because you have, um, enough time to squeeze in a few more minutes in training doesn't mean you necessarily should, if you can do a shorter workout and really nail it and still achieve the objective of the workout and then have a more complete day after that. Um, that's, a great thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about like how much time you should allocate to training. Uh, yeah. Another way that I frame that for my mind, because I'm always tempted to do more. I don't know about all of you, but I'm just like, Ooh, if I could do more, I could get faster. And then I remind myself, you could, you'll, um, you'll only get faster from the training that you can adapt to. And, and sometimes like your life throws you curveballs, and you may have 
a time to do more training, but that doesn't mean that you can actually adapt to that training. Right. That's, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing. I'm bumping more is not microphone. more if you're not <laughs> emptying your cup or more is yeah. not more if you are emptying your cup. Yeah. I yes, do this with well said. retinol. I always think more, I'll look younger, but then my skin gets all red. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like recovering from it. And I just got to space it out, recover. And like it's a universal it right. principle. <laughs> it is yeah. like it's the older true. people will get that. All these young people are like, yeah. what is that? <laughs> I'm thinking of older vain people like myself. <laughs> I'm thinking of and actually scrolling through the feed of our successful athletes. You can listen to our successful athletes podcast. Um, we might publish some of those again, uh, sometime, uh, coming up here soon. Uh, it'd be fun to do. We used to do them consistently every single week and we built up this huge library. It's about all of you athletes that achieve something great with trainer road. Uh, so I'm thinking of Jessica Brooks. Uh, she added 24 Watts to her FTP masters national championship. She did that on majority, like 60 minute workouts, um, with her training plan. I'm thinking of Sergio Sandoval doing a sub nine Leadville, uh, geez, Lauren Hackney with doing a full distance triathlon, Thorn Bickle, Enduro, Enduro national champion added 73 Watts to his FTP. Nadia Hill added 53 Watts to her FTP. But why, were, were they doing shorter workouts or? Yeah. A huge amount of these athletes are doing mid low and mid volume plans where their 60 minute workouts are you know, kind of like the bread and butter. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is like, if you're to look at the average duration is probably closer to 60 minutes than it is to three or four hours, which in our minds, we kind mm -hmm. of have this thing built up where it's like, if I want to achieve something great, I need to have a lot of, of volume because I hear pros train 40 hours a week or something. So in our minds, we kind of <laughs> Ivy's Ivy's eyebrows just shot up sorry. <laughs> 40 hours a week. <laughs> um, so in our minds, we kind of build that up to be something else. Um, uh, Jim Mueller, uh, cyclocross national champion, 74 years old, added 20 Watts to his FTP when he thought that he would never get faster again. Did that with pr pr predominantly 20, 20 Watts at 74. That's yeah. insane. And because you're, you're for going years. Well, you're going down too, right at 74. So it's, it's almost like you're, it's more than that. If you were like a a person in their twenties or thirties. That's incredible. Yeah. In the most recent episode we published with Teresa Harrison, Harrison, uh, Xterra world champ and added 40 Watts to her FTP. So it's, it's just, um, there's what I'm doing is I'm trying to share the fact that like, well, first of all, yes, trainer road makes you faster and go sign up at trainerroad.com. But then number two, you don't have to do huge volume to see big improvements. Um, I've seen this, I'm sure all of us have seen the very same principle applied to us in our own lives. And really it's, I think that when you talk about what sort of, how long should your training be, how much volume should you do? It's the volume that you can recover from. And that's going to change from year to year or season to season in your life. It's just going to change and you just have to kind of, uh, be okay with it, but just know how much 60, how much benefit you can get from 60 minutes. I, it's I astounding something. too. like <clears throat> a very common pattern too, is you could go 60 all the time, David. And then once in a while you do that long outdoor ride with your friends. That's three or four hours, especially if you have something that's longer, you can get some of that other benefit that you normally wouldn't get in that 60 hour. And that's a good balance rather than thinking, you know, if I don't get a three to four hour ride every weekend, like I'm just, I'm just not going to get faster and this is impossible. And then you could, maybe when you do that three to four hour ride, you, you do a recovery, you skip that next workout. So you really recover and then you get back into it that, uh, you know, that Tuesday workout, if you did it on a Sunday or something that yeah. what Chad. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's what you were talking about earlier, and I didn't exactly pick up that thread. The idea of 60-minute workouts being sufficient until they're not dissipates more rapidly with different types of workouts. And, and endurance effort or endurance level stuff where you're working at you know, 60, 65, 70% of threshold over you know most, if not all, of an hour – it's only going to be again, a sufficient stimulus for long enough or for, for as long as it is. So that will top out more quickly. You, you'll get to a point where you can do all five hours all week long endurance level one straight hour each time. And it will hit the ceiling much sooner than, than all the, just the many variety of VO two max workouts you could slot into that same hour. And a bit of an aside here, but this is why Ivy you've mentioned this on the forum plenty of times too, but this is why you can't compare levels across zones. Um, because mm. no matter what a 60 minute workout, like if you did 60 minutes at threshold for an hour, you're like, that's, that's maxing out your threshold, right? So you can mm -hmm. expect that to have a very high workout level. Whereas if you're just doing 70% FTP for an hour, that's not going to be a really highly rated endurance workout. So that's why it's not good to compare a level four across the different zones and you're using trainer road to be able to understand your workouts better. Um, really helpful, helpful, a bit of context with that. 
I have some one workouts thing, that I want to share that are one hour workouts, but Nate, uh, go ahead on your point first. I want to talk about stuff that's not done yet. And okay, <laughs> but just the, the vision. So workouts level yeah. two, what's happening right now is we're still validating. We found an issue that we had to tweak. And because of that, it's like the 90, 10 rule where then that moves other stuff around. So we're, we're getting the scoring just right. And we have to, we did a whole new suite of how to like compare and I don't know. We have to do data engineering because when we compare it, we have to compare it against millions of rides. Like in the data set, we do a small data set and then do a big one to validate it. So anyways, that's what we're working on. But in once that is out, the next thing we're doing is these plan updates. And one of them is what we just talked about is, so we base everything, like you have an FTP in Trina Road, but with, with our progression levels, it really gets unpaired from FTP because there's a huge swing in there about what percentage like relative to FTP you are. And that's how we get around where everything isn't like locked to FTP. So when you hear people in the future, I'm sure you say, hey, they use FTP, but it's not locked to that because of progression levels. We look at what you do and that always evolves. So with this issue of a 60 minute endurance ride, is let's say you only have 60 minutes on one day and you top out and let's say the top of endurance is like 65%. And we're like, well, you can't go any higher, but with workouts levels V2, what we can do is say, okay, what is the next ride that is higher? And maybe you do step into tempo and it's 67%. And people go, well, I did a temple workout. That's the gray zone. Oh my goodness. But really relative <laughs> to where you are in your fitness and everything else you're doing, if you kind of break free from FTP and just go, okay, my levels, the Watts I'm doing for these time ranges are going higher and I'm being progressive inside of them. That's really important. Um, another one would be sweet spot, sweet spot for an hour. You can get, that's not that hard, right? And there'll be a time where Depends. we could either <laughs> give you a new FTP. Well, well I mean with intervals, right? We can give you sure, a new right. FTP. Yeah, yeah and adjust everything. Or if your other levels are relatively low, let's see if you're to max relatively low, you're still working on that, but your sweet spot is right there and you're at like 94%, you know, repeated intervals. If we give you a 95%, well, now you're in like technically the threshold zone in our system and other people's systems too, but you're still pro progressive on that. So we can keep the same progression for what the, like we call them um, workout profiles for how that, what the types of intervals we want you to do. It can be progressive and we can kind of like slide between the zones. We always say it, it's not like a, it's not like a gate. It's like a sliding window inside of that. And you're not going to slide all the way up to VO2 max. Well, your AFTP will detect your FTP and do something new, but we still want you to grow three by three inside VO2 of, max. <laughs> yeah, we want to grow inside of all the, the, the uh, grow inside of all the, um, the training zones that we have for you. And we could do it other ways where we just update your FTP all the time. But then if you were really low in like a few two max, we'd have to really push you down. And mm -hmm. this is a way that makes it a little more, um, uh, flexible. And I think you'd get a really good training benefit that that's what we're trying. That's what we're working on. Once we get this workout levels V2, because there are so many workouts you have to build inside of here for this system to work. And I think we added, how many are we adding, John? Like, Oh, it's thousands it's and thousands and thousands. thousands. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> Big project. Um, I want to share some of my, and, and Maxine, uh, our producer, uh, she'll be able to put these up on screen so you can see them. But I wanted to share some of my favorite one hour workouts for those that aren't familiar with them. Or if you're just doing train now, or you just want to drop in and pick a workout, some ones that I like personally, um, for endurance, I like, and these are all one hour long, these workouts. I like beach. It's three by 15 and it's, there's no breaks. It's just 60 to 75% uh, endurance. And I like breaking endurance work into those like 15 minute chunks, uh, too small. Um, is it, that's fine too, but I like those 15 minute chunks. I like beach pioneer for tempo It's 12 by three to five minutes. So it's a, like a lot more broken up between 80 to 85%. Sweet spot is ton of aura. This is, I swear, this is probably going to earn like the most liked, like any high school yearbook. Uh, I see so many people do ton of board and they're like, I love this workout on Instagram. Go to and find us on Instagram, by the way, you can find trainer road on there, but they share the workout and they love it. It's really like friendly. It starts you out and you're at 94% FTP for a minute. And then it just steps down slowly down to 85% a minute. And then it steps back up to 94% and the intervals are seven minutes or the sets are seven minutes long and there's five of them, but it makes it, you kind of feel like a hero. Um, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a really good interval workout for sweet spot. And then over unders, I bet a lot of people won't like this one, but I do a Palisade minus two. It's one minute under and two minutes over. Uh, but it's, so I think that's why some people might not like it as much, but I love it. Uh, and it's 95% under then 105% over three by nine. And I think one of my favorite workouts is Megantic in the whole catalog. And Maxine will put this one up on screen so you can see it, but it's 
reduced amplitude billets, which basically have you doing something like 125%, so high VO2 for 15 seconds. And then you do 15 seconds at sweet spot and then 15 seconds at high VO2, 15 seconds at sweet spot. And you repeat that a handful of times for like seven minutes or so, I believe in this one or five minutes, but you start off with a hard race effort. So you start off hard. And then after that, you do those billets. I love that workout. Feels really good. Feels like a mountain bike race. Um, I dig it. So yeah, those are them. And Santa Rita is another anaerobic one. That's, that's lots of fun too. It's kind of like a good variety and gives you work at different durations. So there's tons of them we've built out. Like Chad mentioned, like originally 60 minutes were kind of like the bread and butter when we were building out trainer row and we've added on and Nate said, we're adding on forever. We'll be adding on more workouts that, that will add to this at different durations, but there's tons to pick from. So you should go to trainerroad.com, sign up, give it a shot and get faster with 60 minute workouts. Uh, Paul's question. Hey guys, love the podcast and your openness and honesty you all provide for your listeners. I have a question about the possible impacts anxiety or depression medication may have on training. I'm going to start working with a psychiatrist soon, and I know that medications are often recommended. Are there things I need to think about when taking these types of medications? Do I need to think about changing anything in my training or nutrition? And will I notice any side effects from these medications? Thanks all and keep up the good work. Chad, do you want to uh, lead off on this one? Yeah. Cool. I'd love to. So, uh, and T, I do understand that there's a difference between depression and anxiety. Um, they're definitely two distinctly different, but I'm guessing a, a fair amount of overlap, uh, psychological uh, disorders, mental disorders, whatever they're considered. And we're going to address them a, as a unit, though, simply because uh, I think they're both often addressed with, if not exactly the same medication, definitely the same line of medications. So, and, and, and specifically, I think the most commonly prescribed are SSRIs. Nate, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but, yeah. uh, and, and they're, they're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, so whether, and, and as the name states, they, they affect serotonin levels and whether it's the changes in the serotonin levels that directly impact uh, the, the patient's feelings or levels of anxiety or, or depression or the changes that are, are basically the stage that these changes set that lend themselves to other forms of treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy or other um, add-on supplemental uh, forms of treatment isn't really up for debate here. It's not what we're going to discuss. There's there's uh, not, not a heck of a lot of value in that discussion for us, but I do want to talk about these SSRIs simply because I want to talk about the side effects ever so briefly because that's what, that's what Paul's asking us. Uh, first, and, and I'm just going to focus on the ones that might affect performance, uh, starting with the, the uh, maybe the most bland, but headaches. I mean, obviously that's going to going to have an impact. Sleep seems to run the gamut. Everything from insomnia to sleeplessness or sleepiness. So the opposite end of things. Loss of appetite uh, that would be pretty important from an endurance athlete's perspective. Dizziness, absolutely. Even if you're riding a trainer, for that matter. And GI issues too run the gamut, everything from diarrhea to constipation to indigestion, and then just general feeling sick. But it's worth noting that most of these side effects improve with time. And, and if they don't improve, there are a lot of different medications in the same line of you know, the, the, the overarching or the umbrella of the type of medication. So what I took from the reading that I did up to uh, on this particular matter is that different, different SSRIs have different side effects, different, differing effects. So shop around you know, work with your qualified health professional to limit those negative effects of side effects as much as possible. Mm. Okay. And that's, that's the one side of the issue I chose in mostly because the literature led me here to focus on the brighter side of endurance sports as they relate to depression and anxiety. Because what I noticed as I moved through the papers is that it's both widely studied and demonstrated that exercise improves, but probably won't replace unless you or your physician deem it so pharmacological interventions or treatments. So what I'm getting at is that you're, you're on the right, you're on the right path. You're already doing endurance exercise. You're already an endurance athlete. And now you're, now you're seeking psychiatric uh, help of, of, of some form, but the two coupled together seem to play really nicely together. And I just want to throw out a couple, just a handful of studies, touch on them ever so briefly, but I want to drive this point home. Uh, Harkening back to 2012, systematic review of uh, studies on exercise for anxiety disorders. They just looked at eight randomized controls, controlled trials that met their inclusion criteria, and they found quite simply that both aerobic exercise and non-aerobic exercise seemed to reduce anxiety symptoms. 
come forward a couple years to another systematic review of studies on exercise as an add-on strategy for treatment of major, in this case, major depressive disorder. They looked at 13 full text articles and the finding when they looked at exercise as an, uh, they they looked at exercise as what's termed an adjunct, adjunctive, pardon me, which is a supplemental treatment with antidepressants on depression. And they found that exercise may reduce depressive symptoms, but they did note when they looked at the, the fuller, the systematic reviews and metas that it's a bit more inconclusive when looking at exercise as a sole treatment of depression. So it's still an adjunct. It's not a replacement, but still largely positive in nature. My point being simply that as much as I would like to tell you, all you need is exercise to cure all your psychological ailments and afflictions. Well, the literature does not support that. 2017 in Frontiers, in particular Frontiers in Pharmacology, they looked at two categories of publications. One was randomized controlled trials. The other was meta-analyses and uh, systematic reviews. The RCTs pointed to the fact or their findings that exercise and antidepressants were equally effective. Also, exercise plus antidepressants versus exercise only, there were more significant improvements observed following the combination of the two. And then almost all of the reviews supported the use of exercise in the treatment of depression, at least as an adjunctive. So still nothing really supporting exercise as a standalone treatment, but the two, again, work really well together. And then 2020, another paper in Frontiers, this time Frontiers in Psychology, pointed to a synergist synergistic effect of exercise coupled with antidepressant treatment via, in their words, promotion of neuronal health and recovery in major depressive disorder and MDD-related brain circuitry. So put simply, this combination actually led to brain repair, neuronal repair. And then to round it out, <clears throat> 2021 uh, CIS review meta-analysis of RCTs backed up all the findings I just went over. 2022 did it again, this time with regards to non-severe depression, which I think may encompass more people. I can only speculate, but I'm sure there's a range of, of uh, depressive symptoms. And they went a step further by stating that there was no difference between exercise and pharmacological interventions when it came to reducing the depressive symptoms of non-severe depression. So in the case of non-severe, either once again as an adjuvant treatment or an alternative treatment, an actual replacement, my, my takeaway being that there's a bit more flexibility with lower depressive severity, which leads me to my overall takeaway, which is that regardless of the degree of depressive disorder, the literature seems to support across the board the notion that exercise should probably be part of the picture. Nice. Uh, so in this case, looking uh, at Paul's specific situation, like you said earlier on, Chad, um, seems like Paul's on a good path, right, uh, in, in order to, like to address this. Um, Ivy, I don't know if you have anything to add on this one. I'm thinking of um, Ivy probably knows way more cyclists than the rest of us, right? <laughs> like having gone through like, you know, so many different teams and everything else. And, uh, it's not uncommon I'm uh, for, for, uh, Paul's situation isn't uncommon for sure. So I don't know if you have any experience uh, with this or even secondhand experience that you want to share. Absolutely. Um, you need to tell your psychiatrist or even if you, for the rest of us who just need to see a primary healthcare provider about this, you need to tell them that you are an athlete and that it's your concern to have, choose something that will effectively serve you as a medication without having a, um, you know, a laundry list of side effects. And that will help your healthcare provider understand what to prescribe you because there is a very distinct difference between um, the side effects that you'll see with SSRIs, SNRIs, and NDRIs, I think. Um, they're all very different um, medications that can serve different, um, you know, mental health ailments. And so being uh, transparent with your, with your doctor that you want something that will have um, – you, you know, you're keeping exercise in mind because it is part of your treatment will help them better understand how to meet your needs. Um, so it's totally okay to want to prioritize training and exercise and your wellness as you're being treated for this, you know? Um, so yeah, be honest with that, um, with your doctor about that and the, it'll help them prescribe you something more effectively. Great advice. Thanks, Ivy. Mm -hmm. Nate, do you have anything to add to this one? Sure. Um, I've talked about that I've suffered from depression and I use, I have ADHD also, Wellbutrin, which is also called Bupropion. And it's not an SSRI. It's, I forget exactly what it is, but it's very different. because It's an NDRI. You, 
NDRI. Okay. So a lot of people think of SSRIs and they think of like, um, you know, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, feeling like, uh, like numb to the world or something. That's maybe what you've seen in movies or heard of the people. This, the Wellbutrin, none of that. It's, um, of course your doctor has to describe you what is right. But in my experience for, cause let me back up. It's so hard because this whole area, th some things work for some people and they don't work for other people. And that's the part or the side effects. It works for you, but the side effects are so big that they got to put you on something else. So this journey that you go through could be, I know someone went through five different medication medications and some people may give up earlier, but the, I would say, you know, keep trying with your, with your doctor to, to figure out what is the right balance for you. And for me, I was lucky. We skipped right to Wellbutrin, which isn't standard. There, there are some reasons why. And because of that, I mean, it's, I, I don't get, I'm, you can see, I don't look numb, right? Like I still have, um, all the feelings and stuff, but what can happen is I used to be able to think of something and I'd get this like rise in my chest of like anxiety and then I'd d depression too. They're, they're very interrelated, interrelated with me. And I'd like ruminate on things and I couldn't get it out of my brain. I'd have problems like listening to stuff. Well, Butrin after like hmm, two weeks, it just stopped. And then I noticed I worked with my doctor and there were some things that would get to me and I upped my dosage. And now it's like, it's very, very manageable. Um, and then I take this other one called, oh, what's it called? It's with a B. It's an anxiety medicine. Bus buspropion? Buspro I can't say it. Someone's going to text in. It's not bupropion, but it's like buspirin or something like that. Um, that's one that I can take like twice a day and that lowers it too. There's another, this is again, I'm not giving medical advice. This is something to talk to your doctor about because I don't know. SH, you know, T about it. Um, there, there's one though that I am going to talk to my doctor about called Avaletti. Avaletti. It's a new one where it's well butrin plus this other, um, it's actually something that's in cough syrup that kids get high on, but it's a very minimal mm -hmm. dose. And they put the two together. <laughs> they found out that it worked much faster than well butrin. Yeah. You'd have like a quarter of the amount of well butrin and it was more effective also than well butrin. It got approved in like August by the FDA. So again, if you're, I think Wellbutrin has been out since the eighties. So you can probably, you're pretty safe with like the track record where this is a drug with Wellbutrin. I think it makes Wellbutrin stay in your system longer. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's one that I'm kind of interested in to see what it's like. Um, I also know with Wellbutrin, like if you stop it, it suddenly it could cause seizures or you take too much. There's all these, all these things have crazy side effects, right? I've, I've told this story before my ex-wife, she had a stroke and it was probably due the doctors thought to birth control. And that's just an example of, you know, you see those, you, see, you hear on the internet, all those little, little side effects stuff, just be aware of it. But I'm telling you, treated depression is amazing. And there are so many drugs out there that can, if you work with your doctor and you manage it right, that are available. And I think some people say, you know, meditation, eating healthy, um, journaling, uh, you know, exercise. therapy, exercise, all those things, yes. And if you can do the, the both, that's amazing. And what my, what my doctor said is she's like, if we treat the underlying, like some of the chemical imbalance on you first, that other stuff's going to work even better because it can be even hard to start that stuff with your depression. Like she tells someone who's depressed to like, get out of bed, much less get on a bike and do a 60 minute workout. It can be extremely hard, but if you can get out of bed and you can do a 60 minute workout it like it stacks on each other and your whole life is so, so much better. Sure. So it, uh, the main takeaways that I'm getting here is, uh, it's a journey, uh, that you could go on and as you go throughout it, um, make sure that you're working hand in hand with a person that, that has your best interests in mind. That's well informed of your circumstances, right? Ivy. Um, and then also, uh, you know, good on you for, in this case, Paul, for going down this path and being able to do it. And if you are listening to this podcast, likely you're an exerciser, or at least you're interested in exercise. And at the very least, remember that that can be a good thing for you. Um, there is a lot of narrative that exists out there that kind of poses like, or positions exercise or activity or the things you love at odds with treatment for mental health in any number of different ways. Um, but this is, uh, that isn't always the case. And, and in fact, they can work together quite well. I want to just, I want to just re hit this home. This, this, this thing home more. I can't talk today. If you know, you've heard scary stuff about these things about the numbness and all the side effects, there are different kinds as Ivy put it out. And what you're probably hearing is like one kind and you that might even affect you that way. 
like it might be like the Prozac, the SSRIs, and that might even impact you that way. So I just, for people who are scared of those side effects, there are other ones and you can work through doctors, I've said that don't do that stuff or, but that might still work for you. And even with some side effects, you get slight weight gain, but I mean, just in the cycling terms in general, but you're not depressed and you work out more, it's, it's like gonna balance out too. You know, it's so much better not to be depressed and have your whole life full than to worry about like two or three pounds. Like mm. I'm telling you, and if you're just concerned about being faster, you're probably still going to be faster. If you're suffering for depression and you work out more, as Chad said, uh, you're probably going to even that weight loss. And I mean, it's not going to be, I don't know. I think people get really scared about it. Right. I was scared about it. Yeah. So scared that yeah. it's going to be like this numb, like, uh, what's that? Like, I forget a garden state, like, you know, they show yeah. movies about this kind of thing and it can get scary. Well, when people talk about their experience in that, like you have no idea what dosage they're on, how long they've been on it. Um, uh, you know, what specific prescription they're on. Um, just, yeah, have, have regular open dialogue with your provider who's prescribing this to you once you start and share your concerns. And, um, like Nate said, it's way more important to be healthy than to make sure you're fast on the bike because you will be faster when you're healthier. Happiness Watts. Right. Things that Happiness stack are too. <laughs> people like, yeah, to, I was, someone say they have depression, but they might be bipolar too. On top of that it could be stacked. A lot of these things stack on top of each other. So when you hear their experience, you don't know the full picture and that's why it's so individual. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Y'all. I'm glad that we're talking about this. Um, Phil's question says I'm returning or, or a returning athlete 15 years ago, managed to get around Ironman UK in 12 hours. Way to go. Uh, Phil, the more I swim, bike and run, uh, the more, like I've always respected Ironman athletes, but the more I realize how absolutely immense that is. Nate, you've done an Ironman or just seven, I have, three? I've done Ironman and I, I just did it like a couple days ago, but the, the Wait, joy, like you as, did the Ironman a couple days ago. I did this, the joy oh. <laughs> of someone goes, Oh, maybe you did a long event. And I go, yeah, an Ironman. And you get to tell them the distance and you get to oh, see yeah. their, like their shock. They're like, wait, yeah, wait, yeah. 112 mile, but they have, people don't know how long a 2.5 mile swim is, but then you say, and then a marathon and they're just like, whoa. And I, <laughs> I, I get joy out of that. I probably all triathletes do too, of the, uh, people get shocked because it is, they, no, people don't realize how hard that is too. Yeah. Uh, does anybody, Chad, uh, do you ever want to do an Ironman? <laughs> the, the, the look on his face. It's just too much training. It sounds like an awful day too. So yeah. Yeah. Ivy, are you going to do an Ironman someday? No. No. I went to a, the, the shock that Nate was just describing. Um, I experienced that this weekend at a, uh, a social event where, you know, people that aren't cyclists are like, Oh, you're a cyclist. You must do Ironmans. And I'm like, absolutely not. And they're like, why not? And I tell them, you know, okay. First of all, dog paddling. Okay. The swim, I would drown and then riding over a hundred miles and then running a marathon and just describing that to them. And then like John, your experience about, um, having to wear, uh, latex gloves at the aid stations or oh, when you were helping gosh. them one time. Oh, yeah. Right? When we were catching bikes. Yeah. At Kona. Yeah. The sport is was, brutal. I'm not doing yeah. it. So describing that <laughs> to people that like don't know <laughs> makes it reiterates to me that it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Cyclocross is like the opposite of that when you're like, yeah, I race bikes and they're like, Oh, what? Like, uh, do you do like a hundred miles? And you're like, we ride around in circles in a park. Like, <laughs> <laughs> if it's really it's like muddy, we'll only race yeah. for four kilometers. And they're like, yeah. what? And I'm like, yeah, just, we run the whole time if it's really muddy. And they're like, bike one time we rode through the sand volleyball court. It was pretty cool. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's awesome. Um, uh, so kudos to you, Phil, uh, for doing an Ironman. Uh, but since then, I have done almost nothing. So this is 15 years ago. Uh, I'm turning 50 next month and I want to be able to do some mountain bike rides with my son. Well, look at that. Like that's like, uh, the, oh man, it warms my heart right there. Um, looking at four to six hour rides, uh, in the Welsh Hills and bike park, Wales. Those are big rides. I hope your son's not like, uh, watch Phil's son is on a strider and he's like four to six hours. Son. <laughs> 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 Here we go. <laughs> Fuel with 90 grams an hour. Um, I subscribed to trainer road and, and using plan builder. I chose the low volume cross country marathon plan with no specific race. I don't want to race. I just want to get fit and enjoy riding with my son. So my question, is there a return to fitness plan you would suggest for a slightly and in quotes, portly older chap who just wants to get fit and lose some pounds. I really enjoy listening to the podcast. Keep up the excellent work. Uh, Ivy, do you want to start, uh, start with this one? You, you kick. Us yeah. Off. 
I love this question because this was this is a super common question when people think that train road is for bike racers. It's not just for bike racers. And just because you have to choose a discipline in plan builder doesn't mean you're necessarily preparing to race that discipline. Um, like this is a great example of how by choosing the XC plan, when Phil wants to ride XC, these this plan and this workouts, these workouts and these progressions are meant to better prepare Phil to enjoy their time racing or sorry, riding XC and you don't have to race. And so in that regard, when you're using plan builder and picking a discipline, any plan that you can stick to with consistency will be your return to fitness plan. Um, and if you don't know what discipline to choose, um, you know, rolling road race, grand fondo, um, any plan that looks interesting and fun that, you know, you can stay motivated to continue doing and regularly not skip workouts because you're excited about doing it. And because you picked a volume that you can sustain will be a return to fitness plan. Um, so for Phil, for their goals specifically of wanting to just gain some fitness and maybe lose a little weight, I would recommend, um, don't skip your high intensity workouts that are part of your plan. That's easy to want to do when you start getting back into training and you're fatigued and something looks hard. So you want to, um, just do like an endurance workout instead so that you'll be fresher for the next one. Don't do that. Um, if, if you're fatigued, do an alternate that's shorter, but those high intensity workouts will really be important for Phil specifically with wanting to change your body composition. Um, don't skip those. Uh, and in body composition goals, you know, like at face value, it, it can just look like exercise more and eat less. And we know that it's far more complicated than that. Um, as your relationship with food and exercise changes as you get back into training. So I just want Phil to expect to see change slowly. Don't do something crazy, like pick a high volume plan and do a more than 500 calorie deficit right away because you want to see change mm. fast and you want to, uh, gain fitness fast. You have to move slowly and, um, don't be crazy and pick a high volume plan just in general. Yeah. Don't do that. Very, <laughs> very few people, but high volume plans for. Yeah. Right. We should do an upcharge for it. That like people won't do it on accident. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an extra 20 idea. and then like it's problem solved. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Amazing. Nate. I don't know how we didn't think of that before. This is sorry. Uh, Ivy, did you have more? Did I, was that, were you, the, were you done? Oh, oh I had to say um, that joke. That's all right. No, <laughs> great. I, I just want, also wanted to advise lastly that, um, when you're thinking about changing your relationship with food, um, with your goal of body composition in mind, um, focusing on macros and plate composition, um, and fueling your workouts correctly will be a better way to change your relationship with food and approach, um, approach your body composition goals than just trying to do a big calorie deficit. Um, so focus on those things, feel your workouts. I have, you talk about on those intense days, like you're a little fatigued, do a shorter one with workout alternatives and then the longer one. How do you know, and how do you deal this when there are some days where you should actually skip it? I'm guessing, right. When you're really actually super mm -hmm. tired, how do you balance the difference then in your racing of doing a, a lower intensity, do actually do recovery and just waiting for the next intense workouts or doing a complete rest day? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it takes a really long time as an athlete to be the kind of athlete that knows before you start the workout, whether it's worth trying to attempt it or not. And so that's why I almost never advise athletes to do that because I think it's a very small percentage of people that really would truly know before you start. And even now I surprise myself when I'm like, uh, there's no way, there's no way. And I just start it. And then I always give myself, um, 15 or 20 minutes of just getting through the warm up to decide if I should try it or not. And even then it's not too late to, um, it's not too late to, sw to swap it out for an alternate at that point. If I'm like starting out and like, I know, okay, I can do something like this today, but it needs to be shorter. It's not too late to just, um, end your warm up, start the new workout, scrub forward, you know? Yeah. I've done that so many times where I go through the workout. You can see on my Strava, I get about two minutes into the first interval and I go, nope, I upload. <laughs> and then you see me riding like recovery for 30 minutes. And I'm like, I'll come back to battle another day. But I, I tried and it actually feels pretty good to try. And even if you fail and you use something else, you're like, I gave it an effort and you didn't get into that big hole. And I've done that too, where you just grit when you grit so, so hard that <laughs> I like talked about all fatigue, I fall off that cliff. 
and it's like days then before you feel good again. That's, that's, man, if you could figure out, that's such a problem problem with everyone. And if you could figure it out and measure it where you knew the days that was productive and the ways that weren't, it's, that would be amazing. I know there's lots of things with that people say can do it, but there hasn't, but I've seen one that is like a hundred percent dead on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how Phil trained for the Ironman, uh, so I won't assume. Um, but I will, uh, I bet Phil, like you probably, if you were able to complete an Ironman, you did it in 12 hours, you did, you were probably following some sort of consistent routine and you probably already understand the value in consistency. But the one thing that I really like about the approach that you're talking about, Ivy and Nate, of just, you know, going out and seeing if it works and if it doesn't work, then adjusting and doing something different is because at the very least, what you're building there is the habit of consistency. And if you have that habit of consistency, aside from the fitness benefits that you have, you suddenly have this template that becomes like something that you operate on. Your body can use that and to be able to rely upon it. And it can get a lot of strength and courage and, and confidence from that. And that's like a huge, huge help and a huge part of things. Uh, Chad, you just mentioned that the other day, I think where mm -hmm. you're like right now for you, the big thing isn't getting huge fitness gains. It's just having the habit of consistency. Yeah. The, the importance of consistency. We, we talk about it all the time because it, it's real and, and endurance adaptation, endurance performance is rewarded more than anything else by consistency. I, I mean, just if, if you lack everything else, but you're consistent, you, you get on the bike, like you're talking about, Jonathan, it, it uh, for whatever reason, this reemergence into a training regimen was the hardest I've ever encountered. I just didn't want to do it, but I did want fitness for when spring rolls around and I want to enjoy my rides and I don't want to build the fitness on the rides. I don't want to, uh, I, I just, I want to hit spring running, right? I, I want to enjoy it from the get-go. As soon as the weather's good, I want to be out there and I want to be able to go for a couple, three hours ride without just suffering the whole time. So I set the bar really low by my standards and just wanted to get myself on the bike five days a week. And the only way I was going to do that without intimidating myself low. was- Super was low, not seven. Super low, it's five. <laughs> Super low. The five days a week, but 30 minutes. You should rides. do double and, days. And, and, this, and this is yeah. my point. I needed something that wasn't intimidating because anything that's even mildly intimidating is yet another obstacle you're putting in the way of something that is in general intimidating. So I just uh, did that 30 minute rides. And, and it was a little bit of an eye opener too, because I started doing workouts that training systems that I haven't trained in a long time because they weren't interesting in the context of 60 and 90 minute rides. So I started doing a little bit of anaerobic work, some sprint workouts, some it just across the board. I was doing everything because they were short workouts and I knew I could only do so much damage. I only had to be on the workout or on the bike for 30 minutes at a time. So what the heck? And it actually kind of created a almost a playful environment for me to get back on it and get with it and reestablish my connection with being on the bike consistently many times across a week. And here I am, I don't know, six, seven weeks later, if that, and my squeeze by rides are 90 minute squeeze by rides again, and I'm getting through them and stuff that six weeks ago, I would have been like, I'm never getting on the bike again. If those are the sort of workouts I have to do, I'm just not doing it. I'm going to pick a new sport. Hmm. I, I like that idea of just like the, the variety plan where like every 30 minutes, it's just a different zone. Yeah. And you just like rotate fun. through them. You go all <laughs> of those zones. And it's, mm -hmm. it's more of just to be consistency, consistent and entertain you rather than target a specific race outcome. Yeah. And if that's the case for Phil, um, right. Ivy, like another approach. So Phil, you may be the sort of person you train for an Ironman. So you may really need a plan and you like having that plan on your calendar. But in this case, could, they could also just use train or train now, right. That's Ivy. What and I did not have a plan on their calendar, but just know that like on these days I will open up train road and use train now to pick a workout. Yeah. I was wondering what Phil's mindset is if they're, uh, super intimidated by, cause sometimes it can be scary to, you know, look at your entire plan or the scope of what the next few weeks will look like, like Chad was saying and feel intimidated and not want to do it. Um, and train now is great for that. You get to really dictate what the intensity of your workouts will look like and build a little bit of a foundation so that when you're ready to start real structured training, um, you're not, it's not as, it's not as scary. And especially if Phil isn't racing, I just want some comprehensive fitness. Something like train now is a great way to stay motivated as long as you can remain consistent, as long as you, you know, can hold yourself accountable and not seeing on this calendar day, I need to do this. Um, mm. so I'm curious how, how self-motivated Phil is in that regard. 
Yeah. And for those that don't know, train now is, is the, it's a workout recommender. It looks at what you've done recently. And then it says today do this workout. And then you tell it how long you want to work out and it picks a, a workout for you. That's appropriately hard, which is really cool. So then that way you don't just jump in and completely blow yourself up. Um, <laughs> as, it looks like as I'm, how, as I'm often to do. It looks like your progression levels too. It's like how you perform in all the different z- zones and, and considers your, what you did prior too. exactly. So team. both. Yeah. Workouts. Exactly. I mean, super cool. Um, <laughs> it's a very popular feature for a lot of folks. Um, so good luck, John. My heart is warm uh, and very emotional thinking of you enjoying rides with your son, uh, on a mountain bike. That's like, uh, my life dream. So, uh, Tim says, I've listened to all 400 podcasts. <clears throat> oh, forgive me. I skipped John's question. He says, Hey guys, short question with a, with a long background. If you want, just skip the background info. The question is simple. Can you train your max heart rate? That is, can you increase your max heart rate with training? John goes on to mention the fact that like, uh, didn't, they thought that heart rate would just the max heart rate would go down year over year over year. And that's common when you look at like Chad, right? It's 220 minus your age is like the basic formula that a lot of people use to figure out your max heart rate. Um, it's not appropriate for everybody. Uh, your mileage may vary. Um, but in this case with John, uh, John noticed that, Hey, I'm reaching higher heights than I have recently. So, uh, lays out a couple scenarios. I've been doing all just zone two stuff over winter. So I've improved my aerobic base, allowing my heart rate to beat faster. These are proposed, uh, reasons that he's giving as to why he can achieve higher heart rates. Now, number two, I've been doing all zone two. So I'm relatively fresh and I can push harder now. Number three, a combo of one and two. Um, and then I'm going to propose a number four. Uh, maybe John hasn't found his limits ever before. And now he's finding his, <laughs> the, his limits. So there's a lot of different options, but Chad, back to the core question. Can you train your max heart rate to increase over time? Yeah. So let's start with, excuse me. Let's start with John's, uh, three explanations here. First one being I've been doing all Z2 work, endurance work over the winter. So I've improved my aerobic base. Cool. Allowing my heart to be faster. Not exactly. It, it it actually, as your fitness improves, your aerobic fitness improves, the heart rate is going to drop for the same effort level. So your submaximal heart rate is actually going to go down. So it's going to decrease. You will do the same Watts for a little lower heart rate or for the same heart rate, you'll do a little more Watts. So it's a little backwards there, but you're close. And then the second one, I've been doing all Z2 work, all endurance work. So I'm relatively fresh and can push harder now. Uh, that's a, that's a strong possibility. Number three, combination of one and two. And I, and I think once you get the, uh, once you understand number one, it probably is a combination of one and two. So you know, there, there's your answer, but <clears throat> where we're going to go from here is to answer the question, can you increase your maximum heart rate? And really this turned out to be a more complex topic than I thought it'd be. I thought largely I was going to look at it and it was going to be largely, if not entirely genetically predetermined. And I was going to have to figure out how to spin this topic into something related and ideally interesting, but turns out I don't (laughs) even have to (laughs) steer away from it. I can just stay right on track and it is pretty interesting. So changes in maximum heart rate are, according to what I read, according to the literature, the, the pretty broad swath of it, very probably attainable for most of us. And, and this can get pretty complex, pretty mechanism heavy, pretty fast. Uh, extrinsic and autonomic factors, intrinsic, non-autonomic factors, sinoatrial node myocytes, beta adrenergic responsiveness, all these fancy terms. But instead, we're going to stay a little above the clouds, take a slightly higher view and start with First off, a logical deduction just based on the effects of aging on our hearts. And this would be one of those intrinsic factors that I just mentioned. So our our SA node, our sinoatrial node, is basically our natural pacemaker. And it can develop through, you know, wear and tear, aging, fibrous tissue. Now we can develop fatty deposits, you know, often due to neglect. Diet for sure can probably influence that. For sure, probably. For sure, influence that. Um, <laughs> we can lose cells. I mean, this is this is the nature of aging, right? Cells cells die, and ideally, those cells are uh, regrown or uh, sort of looking for repaired. But sometimes we just lose them. And that's it. Uh, and this can lead to slight reductions in heart rate, and this includes our maximum heart rate. Exercise, however, can positively impact some of these. It can it can prevent or reduce those fatty deposits. It can reverse some of that that tissue loss. There's a, a phenomenon called cardiomyocyte proliferation and repair. So you know the the heart muscle cells can increase in number and can repair existing damaged ones. 
So because of this, I think it stands to reason that reversing these issues can reverse the associated changes in heart rate. So a once lower heart rate, uh, a lower maximum heart rate can increase again. And simply due to the reversal of some of the damage, some of the effects of neglect. Okay. Then let's consider the adaptive cap capability of the heart itself. How re really simply we just grow bigger hearts through training, more, more capable hearts. And we've talked numerous times how chronic endurance training can often does lead to what's termed cardiac remodeling and, and most notably left ventricular hypertrophy. So the, the left ventricle's wall, so the chamber that pumps the oxygenated blood out to our muscles in this case, but to the body, it actually thickens due to endurance training demands, something called hemodynamic load. So that, you know, just the demand for a lot of blood all at once and then a substantially reduced demand. And then just all the, all the, the challenges we throw at our hearts, our hearts eventually adapt and we get changes in the cavity dimension itself it actually gets larger, the distensibility. So, you know, how, how well it expands and contracts along with changes in our cardiac afterload and our preload. So there's longer filling phases, there's shorter filling rates, there's lower filling volumes, all sorts of cardiac adaptations. All of this means is it's a more capable pumper, right? We have more blood per heartbeat, lower submaximal heart rate, but according to some, no change in maximal heart rate. According to others, reductions in maximal heart rate, and these stand more to reason or more stand to reason. Nowhere did I find direct evidence of increases in maximum heart rate. Rather, the closest I could come were indirect effects, so basically due to the reversal of the decreases that are brought on by things like endurance training, as I just described. So typically, when we increase our VO2 max through training, it leads to decreases in heart rate, both our maximum heart rate and our submaximal heart rate. In a study back in 2000 by Gerald Zavorsky, in a journal called Sports Medicine, actually quantified these changes in maximum heart rate due to aerobic training. And he, uh, they pinned the number between 3 and 7%. But understand that as pendulums do, that pendulum swings both ways. Training can bring a 3, 3 to 7% decrease in maximum heart rate. Flip side, detraining, or other side of the swing, detraining, which includes tapering, I might add, can yield a 3 to 7% increase in maximum heart rate. So, so all the increases or the decreases that come about due to adaptation can basically de-adapt, put us back where we started. And then finally, also consider the, the simple changes, and these would be the more extrinsic factors, like the change in plasma volume due to endurance training or, or due to heat acclimation and heat acclimatization. Greater blood volume pretty directly correlates with lower heart rates. And then for, for some obvious reasons, for some less obvious, more complex reasons, but we can't just impose a rapid greater demand on our hearts and expect, expect it to morphologically adjust on the same timeline. Uh, changes in plasma well, volume, yeah, yeah. they can happen quickly. <laughs> like, We're talking order of a handful of days. Cardiac remodeling, on the other hand, it's obviously going to take quite a bit longer. So to, to close this one out, I just want to point to some evidence that does exist that demonstrates that much like the, and I think we just touched on this, the oft-touted age-associated decline in VO2 max, we may also be able to mitigate the unfavorable changes in heart rate by staying active, staying healthy, and challenging our aerobic capacity with, again, some level of consistency. This is, uh, Nate, what is your max heart rate? I feel like you have a high, relatively high heart rate. Isn't that correct? No clue now, but when I was running... This is a long time ago, like 198, 200, something wow. like that. It was very high. And Chad, you're particularly low, if I remember yeah, correctly. I don't think I've ever gotten above 180. I think I saw 181 one time in my like 20s. What's Keegan? Yeah. Is he uh, like the butterfly? Normal. Okay. No, normal. Ivy? There was a, a really fit athlete that worked here at uh, Trainer Row before Trevor, and he was like 220 or something crazy. It was all the time. It was normal. Yeah, Ivy. I think my max is around 200, but... To be honest, I'm so sensitive daily to um, all those things that can affect your heart rate on a day-to-day -day basis, like how much caffeine I have in each day, um, how much sleep I get, how much stress I'm under, um, that I may, this might make me a bad athlete, but I don't care. I don't wear a heart rate monitor anymore because I have power. And so those when that metric is so varies so greatly based upon all these external factors. And I know that it's not speaking directly in a one-to-one -one relationship to my fitness. It doesn't mean anything to me. So I don't look at it anymore. It gets, you get in that, that mode of like, you look at this power, you go, my heart rate, it's lower. Is that because I'm in fatigue or because I'm more fit? 
And you're like, yeah. it's one or the other. Oh my goodness. Or is a combination when I'm fatigued or I'm more fit, but I'm also <laughs> like caffeine and then I didn't sleep well, then my hydration's different and it's a time of day. Oh gosh. All those things. Yeah. 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 Meanwhile, you could just, you know, uh, focus on hitting your, hitting your marks, right? Uh, and how it and feels. What you have to do yeah. for training. Yeah. And it's, how it feels. It can, uh, what heart rate can do is I can feel great. And then I see the heart rate and I'm like, that's too high. I must yeah. feel bad. And then I like yeah. start feeling bad because I think it must feel bad. Yeah. Um, I'm once again, as average as it gets like 220 minus your age exactly nails my heart rate and it's nailed my heart rate like every year, um, with it. So I'm like 185. Uh, I haven't seen, I haven't done anything that really probably is going to hit my max heart rate yet this year. Oceanside swim. I'm probably going to be humming along at 185 before I even get in the water in a month. So in a month, that'll be what day is I that? Know, April 1st, <clears throat> April 1st. No joke. Is it a joke? Yeah. Are you <laughs> just kidding? <Yeah>. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Did you see something that John of, died on April 1st in the swim? Yeah. <laughs> we, d- <laughs> uh, we didn't Not make a that joke. a joke. Sorry. <laughs> a little too. jokes to make. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm, uh, oh, no, no, it's fine. The swim has me really nervous, though, especially with just the West Coast and how, like, gnarly our winter has been. And, hmm. you know, I just have to remind myself that in a wetsuit and salt water, I will not sink. Um, oh, it's so. Yeah, it is crazy. You know, You're a little boom. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, even in uh, Lake Tahoe with my wetsuit on, I can't sink. Like it's just, you know, it, it keeps you floating. So, but yeah, anyways, I, I've never noticed like a big, uh, I've just noticed a steady decline. However, I've noticed an increase in performance. Like last year I hit a lot of power PRs, um, f- like best fitness ever. Um, and, and over the last like 18 months I achieved not across all durations, but so it's, it's kind of a, a, and John, for what it's worth, you're not indicating the fact that like, is my heart rate going down there for my potential going down? You're not in the spiral that often happens. Like when we think about, oh geez, heart rate's going down. That means I'm just not as fit as I once was. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I'm just not, I don't pay attention to it. Um, and I don't really, uh, if I even see a max heart rate in a race, I don't know about all of you, but I usually assume like my heart rate monitor was probably reading wrong anyway. So like, you know, who cares? Like, (laughs) you know, if it's, if it's there or not, I I would, I just want to not ride with heart rate. And I did this for a long time because I got really tired of when I'd have like my heart rate monitor would spike or drop out. I would get a bunch of people because I think people give me more credit than I deserve. So on my Strava and Instagram or anything else, and I would share the ride, they'd be like, what happened at minute this of your workout? Was it because you did X, Y, and Z? And is that why your heart rate (laughs) changed? And I'm like, no, man, my heart rate monitor just sucks. And so I didn't wear it for a long time, but then I just got the questions of everybody saying, why don't you wear a heart rate monitor on like every single ride? So, uh, you win some, you lose some, but if you see any weird things with heart rate in my rides, just don't worry about it. It's probably heart rate monitor doing weird stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Tim's question. Last one. Tim says, I've listened to all 400 podcasts, some more than once, and I've learned so much. I appreciate that you kept the focus on answering your answering our questions After answering so many questions, I was wondering if each of you could share one piece of training or racing advice that you haven't yet had the chance to share with us on the podcast. Thanks. I look forward to continuing to learn. Thank you, Tim. If you appreciate this podcast, you can share and rate it with people. Right now, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, share it with people. It does a huge amount and it makes it so that more people will find that more people will find the podcast. Hopefully it builds your trust so that you know that we do have your best interest in mind with training and you sign up with Trainer Road. So this is how the whole world goes around for us. So we appreciate it. Ivy, the advice that you've never shared on the podcast before, but are going to share now, what would it be? Yeah. And I wish that someone would have shared with me when I started racing, Mm. uh, which was to protect my mentality as you move through training and cycling as a whole, um, protecting your mentality from making you feel as though that process of improvement makes you less than, which is, you know, so much of training and cycling as a whole, there are always opportunities to grow and get better and get faster. And it's so easy to slip into a mindset of that makes you not enough or not good enough when it should be, or I wish it would have been framed for me as something that was exciting, like an exciting opportunity to grow. And it was a good thing. And it didn't make me undeserving or not enough that I wasn't at the same level as everyone else, or I didn't have the same, uh, areas of growth that I needed to work on that everyone else did. I wish someone would have told me that. 
I feel like it was on the first ride that I ever did that somebody was like, eh, there's always somebody faster. <laughs> like, yeah. Like somebody right? was already like <laughs> setting me up for like, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I don't we're know. inundated with it with yeah. cycling with ways to like measure up against other athletes mm -hmm. constantly, right? Um, and I wish, and it's okay to do that. Um, and it's good to be realistic about like, this is where I'm at. Um, and that doesn't mean that you should you know, apply toxic positivity and be like, it's okay that I don't have to get that. Like where I'm at is perfect. Like it's okay to want to be better and grow. And what I would advise is that it's okay. And that doesn't make you not worthy or not good. Um, growing is a good thing. Nice. Can I go next? Okay. I know Nate's slated for next, but I totally want to piggyback on top of what I, uh, on what Ivy was saying, because <clears throat> what I have, <sighs> First, let me be clear. Uh, I don't have anything that I haven't shared. I, I'm a bike racer and I'm a coach <laughs> and we're on a <laughs> podcast that encourage us, encourages us to share every bit of information that is in our heads. So I, I struggled with this. I couldn't think of anything that I haven't shared. So I'm just going to reiterate what I said. Uh, I think it was in a hot takes a couple of weeks ago, a piece of coaching advice. I don't remember what the question was even, but it was that... Uh, Try not to chase perfection. And, and I think why it was so heavily on my mind is because we're inundated with so many devices that can measure so many things that we have access to so much information that it's really easy to try to get uh, exceptionally picky, try to try to perfect everything. So, you know, I, I know that my watch should have been here during this workout. I know that I should have gotten this much sleep last night. I know that my HRV, my whatever metric you want to look at, whatever series of metrics you're looking at, it can be so really easy to overmanage those, to, to look at them so closely and to lose sight of what you're actually after, which is good health, fun, improvements in performance, all the things that are broader, more general, a lot more subjective. So, I, and I don't want to, I don't want anyone getting the impression that that data is not worth, worth the time and effort. It absolutely is. There's a lot of value in it, but don't get hung up on it. And this brings me back to a t-shirt I saw way back in my CrossFit days when I actually went to one of the CrossFit games and, and paleo was super big and there were people walking around with their turkey legs and just gnawing on them caveman style, which is, it was ridiculous <laughs> oh then. It's ridiculous Wild now, times. but whatever. Wild times. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. And uh, the t-shirt the that I kept seeing was 100% paleo 80% of the time. And and I, I love that notion. And, and frankly, I, I would tweak it a little bit, just 90% paleo 90% of the time. I like the idea that I'm, I'm, my training is mostly on track most of the time and, and, and just, just kind of work in those gray areas because they afford freedom. They afford flexibility. They allow it to stay fun for as long as it can stay fun. There's hard work to be done and it's not always going to be fun, but it can be fun most of the time. And again, it's a most of the time sort of thing. Most of a, most of anything approach that I'm after here, get it right. Most of the time. Nice. Good one, Chad. Nate. I've shared everything too. Obviously, I'm an oversharer. Uh, <laughs> seriously, right? But there's maybe I've said this again, but I'll I'll say this because I don't talk about it as much as I probably should. If you are scared of something in cycling and other people are not scared, you don't have to like push yourself through to be like a air quote cyclist or like to do things just because everyone else can do it. Like the mountain biking for sure, right? And then cornering and stuff like that. Uh, I would. Still, I'm scared. A lot of mountain bike stuff. I'm like, well, everyone else around me can do it. I should just like push through it. There's like, there's obviously some fear in me that is not common with other people or these people that I'm racing against. So I should then try to overcome it where I just didn't enjoy it. John finally got it one day when he's like, oh. I swam. Then afterwards, he's like, I was shaking. I'm like, that was every ride for me. I like shake afterwards. Yeah. He's like, what? That's not how mountain biking mm -hmm. should be. Yeah. <laughs> that should be fun. I felt really bad actually, because I had like had this. So Nate, and I apologize if I ever did, I hope I didn't ever, you know, tell you to, you know, toughen up and go and just like, and push through and, or do oh, yeah. something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I had never experienced that sort of thing before. And then like, I've, I think I've shared on the podcast, it was like every, for six months, every time I came out of the water. Well, during the water too, but then for like three hours afterward, I would have that shaking feeling after like you get into an altercation or like a near miss of a car accident or a car accident or something. And you have that like shaking, nervous, unsettled feeling. I'd have that for hours after every swim. And then I like shared Nate that with Nate and it's like, this is exactly how I felt when I was mountain biking. 
And I was like, I feel really, really bad for not taking the time to try to understand it. Because in my mind, I was like, oh, it's a technical issue. He's probably just, you know, needs to get in the right technique and you'll feel better and it'll change. But it's just different for everybody. Done. <laughs> That's it. Cool. That's good stuff. Awesome. Um, the, uh, I have two. I have, well, first, uh, when you wear leg warmers, put your socks over the leg warmers. That's my uh, tip that oh I've never Oh, my said God. I'm <laughs> joking. No, no, no. Um, for training, <laughs> uh, sell yourself the truth you want uh, is what I would call it. What I'm getting at here is that every interval is like a really good opportunity for you to manage this relationship between effort, perception, and then like how you react to all of that. And Chad does a good job in the workout text when you're doing these workouts sometimes of walking you through this and making it look easy. Uh, You'll see that uh, used quite regularly in the workout text. Um, But I treat the effort as like the constant, like I'm not gonna adjust that. So how can I adjust my reaction to this effort? What can I do? Am I pulling faces and moving all around? And is that then convincing myself that the effort's even harder than it needs to be? Uh, I'm pretty good at believing myself and I can subconsciously sell myself that the effort is harder than it, is, than it actually is. That's one thing that I think, uh, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it's a very helpful thing for me when it's a tough day or the intensity's hard, or the duration's long, anything else that's challenging. I stop and I think about what truth I'm selling myself about the workout and about the effort. And then I think, how can I alter that to then make it easier for me? Uh, If you do that a lot, uh, not only hopefully will you build better technique on the bike, but also I think it makes it, gives you a really helpful tool to use when on really, really hard days, uh, when perhaps you're not training. Uh, And then on technical skills, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but uh, a three point uh, turn practice, I think is just super, super helpful. And what I mean by that is you have basically like use a rock, a pine cone, water bottles, anything else, and just lay out like a random turn with an entry point an apex and an exit. And then as you, and basically ride so that you get close to all three of those points, like evenly close, set out a normal turn and then move one of those pieces one by one. So move the apex to a different spot. And then pay attention to how you actually have to change how you enter into a turn or how you exit a turn when that apex happens. And if you can do this in a safe environment, um, man, it can really help you understand what you need to do in different turning environments and make turns way more manageable. So move the exit, move the entrance, move the apex, do whatever else, but move them one by one. So then you can see how things change and just take note of how you're changing your lines going through turns. Um, There are a lot of us that, don't work on turns except when we race or when we're on the course. And when that happens, it's, it's really natural for the race environment to feel really scary because we just aren't sure of how to react in those situations. So that can really help is just spending the time to go play bikes and doing so with that three point flexible point system when you work on those turns, just entry apex exit. John, what I like about your pieces of advice is that there's something that you can apply to your mindset and training and development, like wherever you are in cycling, whether you're brand new or whether you're a seasoned pro, like getting better and improving and improving and changing your mindset about training is something anyone like we can all work on, you know? Agreed. Yeah. Thanks Ivy. It's like, I bet we should hopefully Keegan listens to this on the technical skill thing. He's like a gravel racer now. He doesn't even ride <laughs> bikes anymore. He's like, it probably sucks. I could probably wax him, you know, so. <laughs> hope you're listening, Keegan. New challenge. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks everybody for listening in today. Share and rate the podcast. That's a huge help for us and go to trainerroad.com. If you haven't signed up, go there and check it out. If you have questions, you can talk to our support agents. They have a live chat there that you can ask them questions about. Uh, whether you're a racer, whether you're a casual athlete, wh- anywhere in between, you can find something for you and get faster. Uh, so we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.